Welcome to Cheese In Depth. I'm Michael Landis, and today we're being sponsored by the Berry, Dairy Farmers of Wisconsin, and we really appreciate their support and uh, that of Wisconsin Cheese. So today we're really fortunate because uh, I've had the fortune of being able to enjoy these cheeses for a very long time, completely across the United States, and have run into giant, giant drums of these cheeses at stores and, uh, and just beautiful cheeses. So it's really a pleasure to be able to have on uh, Kerry Henning, and uh, he's going to talk about himself, about the cheeses, and of course, we will be doing a virtual tasting at the end here. So hang on with us, and I'm going to turn it over to Kerry. Hi, I'm Kerry Henning, a third generation cheese maker. Uh, my grandpa started making cheese back in 1914, and he made cheese for 49 years, and um, then my dad took over, and he made cheese till just a few years ago, so he has about 50 some years under his belt and I've been making cheese full time since 1981. Well, that was the year of 1940. That was the year that my grandfather started making cheese. Um, he he um, lived just down the road from uh, a local cheese factory and he would help out part time. And um, shortly after he was working there, the owner of the business hurt his back and then um, my grandpa kind of started taking over the responsibilities and um, a couple years later he ended up buying the business. Uh, at that time when grandpa passed away, um, my father was not working full-time in the cheese factory. He had another part-time or he had another full-time job um, in, in, um, in a neighboring community and so he had to decide if he was going to leave this good paying job with vacations and insurance to come back to the cheese factory. And, um, and he decided he wanted to do that. So um, my mom wasn't exactly real happy with him giving up vacation and insurance and things like that. But my dad um, thought that there could be a future in cheese making. So, uh, um, so that was in, you know, like I said, the mid 1960s, 63, 64, that he did that. And a couple years later, um, he built the new cheese factory just down the road about a quarter mile. Uh, for 50 some years, we had an old wooden cheese factory and um, he built a new, a, a brand new brick building then at that point. Where we, you know, like, like I said earlier, we pick up most of our milk all within 20 miles of the plant. When uh, my dad started making cheese, they were all the farms were maybe only within three or four miles of the factory but uh, as farmers started going out of business you know in the 60s and 70s uh, you had to reach out a little further drive a little pick up the milk that you needed to make the cheese and uh, so now that's why we're out about 20 25 miles pick up farmers but um, again these are all the small traditional farmers uh, that you would think about uh, when you think of Wisconsin uh, dairy farmers. Back in uh, 1980, I received my Wisconsin cheesemakers license and uh, started making cheese back then, you know, when I was coming home from college. And then once I graduated from college, I um, just, uh, was making cheese full time. And then, um, then in about 1996, uh, the Wisconsin Milk Marketing Board started this Master Cheesemakers program. Um, and so I got started with that and you needed a minimum of having a license for 10 years and uh, then you could enroll in the program. So I, I had already had like uh, 15, 14, 15 years of cheese making under my belt by the time I started that and uh, started a master cheesemakers program and in 1999 received my first masters uh, in cheddar cheese. And then three years later, I received uh, two more masters, one in Colby and one in Monterey Jack. You have to be a licensed cheesemaker for a minimum of 10 years and um, be making a specific type of cheese for at least five years. So when I first enrolled, I was going to go for my master's in cheddar because I've been doing that already. I've been licensed uh, about 14, 15 years. And so that was the one I went in. And... Um, 
Then as if you get the first thing that happens when you enroll in the master cheesemakers program is they give you an oral examination first. You get a, a couple of cheesemakers or some university people come over to your plant and then just start asking you some basic cheesemaking questions about how it's made, maybe some regulatory things, milk quality, sales, and um, they see how well do you know the entire business. Then if you pass that examination and maybe 20% of the people don't pass it, um, then you're accepted into the program. Then it's a three year type of an apprenticeship program where you um, go to Madison to take some continuing education classes. They're gonna, the, uh, the supervisors of the program are gonna come up, inspect your facilities. They're gonna come and grade your cheese to see if, uh, you know, does it meet master cheesemaker standards. And uh, so you know, you, the classes can vary from um, improving on how to make the cheese you're currently making. You might even bring in professors from Europe where we'll talk about uh, making a European style cheese. So you learn different types of cheeses. You might study about whey and whey byproducts. Then on the other hand, you might um, study about wastewater and how to handle wastewater issues at your plant. So it, it's very encompassing the master program. Uh, so it's a, like I said, it's a three year program. Um, you maybe, maybe three times a year you head down to Madison, take a class. It might be for two days, three days, or four days, it all depending on the class. And then, um, um, so you do that for three years. And after the three years is up, um, and you've completed your coursework, you take an examination. It's a take home exam, open book, but, um, and, oh, and you get one month to complete it, which sounds like a lot of time, but it takes an average person 40 to 60 hours to write it. So between, you know, your family, your, uh, and working, uh, it's quite a time commitment. And, and so you get the one month to do it and then you have to send it in and then it's graded and if hopefully you passed and uh, then you get this uh the designation of a wisconsin master cheesemaker so congratulations on do you have four of them then so uh, three three but it's cheddar yes kobe and kobe and my jack all right let's just start with the basics of the bandage cheese uh it's um, it's maybe the more traditional way of, of, uh, of, of curing cheese where now we vacuum pack most of our cheeses. The traditional way is in a, in a, in a cheesecloth where you might, um, uh, either cave age it, uh, where you might put some lard on the outside of the cheese, or you might dip it in wax, which is a little bit newer technology, which started in the 19, say thirties and forties, we started waxing cheese. Uh, and so um part of when you make a, a bandage style cheese um you can make them all different sizes say as small as a three pound wheel um but to a 12 pound wheel which we do a lot we call those midgets uh we do longhorns which is a shape of a, a wheel of cheese um then we can go up to any size we like anywhere from a 150 pound wheel a 300 pound wheel thousand pound wheels, uh, 5,000 pound wheels, and we've made them up to 12,000 pounds. Um, and we've made several of those where we ship them down to Texas uh, or Puerto Rico. Um, they kind of travel all over the country. But the most popular size wheels are the three to 5,000 pound wheels. We don't make a lot of those every year, maybe um, five or six of them a year, and they go all over the country. And they're used for like promotions or um, like this fall, I'll be, I'll probably be doing a Zoom meeting for, um, we do a, a, a holiday kickoff. Uh, a grocery store wants to do a promotion and they bring in a mammoth wheel to kind of have that, uh, bring the attention to their store. And uh, so we'll have this um, holiday kickoff with a big wheel of cheese that attracts a lot of attention. 
the store will um, have a, a big to do um, with the cheese and uh, then they'll start cutting it up and um, put it into chunks and people are like standing in line to uh, pick up these pieces of cheese. So you must have some pretty large hoops to be able to handle a 10,000 pound wheel of cheese. Well, the cool thing about when we, we have stainless hoops that go up to 2,000 pound uh, cheese, but then after that, we actually make the really big wheels in wooden uh, boxes, we call them, or like a wooden tub, or they look just like a, you know, there's just a, you know, just a, I always think like a water tower on, on, on Petticoat Junction. Uh, so they're just a big round tub uh, with staves around the outside. You know, just, it's a, they're one inch thick boards with um, steel banding around the outside. And uh, so we make sure that the box is good and clean and uh, we line it with a cheesecloth and then we start filling it with our uh, cheese curds and uh, press it overnight to make a big wheel of cheese. So it is interesting that we use a wooden box uh, for making our various biggest, for the biggest cheeses, because it's, it's uh, pretty hard to like disassemble a uh, stainless form, but a wooden box with staves, we can take the banding off after the cheese is um, good and hard. Um, and then we can let the cheese dry, we wax it, and then we can uh, band it, uh, put the staves back on, band it up, and then it's ready uh, for more curing or um, sending, yeah, and then sending it out to the grocery stores. Well, uh, you, can, you can only make, you can make the, only the best cheeses with the best milk. And so we're always working with our farmers and reminding them about the quality, importance of quality of milk. We have, uh, um, a fieldman, uh, someone on staff that goes out and visit these farms uh, if they're having any issues um, and then just do um, inspections every now and then making sure that they're meeting at least some minimum standards. Um, we have the state also goes around and does inspections and also um, federal government has uh, um, an inspector that um, I think once every other year, they're going around to the farms, inspecting the farms to make sure that they're meeting minimum standards. So um, milk quality is, a, a, is very important to us. And you, um, without good quality milk, it's, it's impossible, impossible to make good quality cheese. Uh, so then when it comes to like the next step of making good quality cheese, um, so much of it has to do with uh, you know, you can define quality in many different ways. And um, we, we like to think that with our cheese, we've got a very flavorful, good, nice, clean flavor um, and tons of flavor with our cheese. Uh, we don't force cure anything. We use good cultures. And uh, it, it's so, and then we try to find the best ingredients. We don't worry about the cost of the ingredients, if it, if it makes the cheese taste good, that's what we're after. So uh, uh, we're looking at quality in you know, many different, different ways when we make our cheese. Oh yes, flavors, that's been the big thing in the last uh, 10 years. Uh, just like you might see with alcohols and things, everybody has gone to flavors, it's happened in the cheese industry as well. And so it's been fun trying to come up with uh, new flavors uh, that the consumers might want to try. And so, you know, like our grocery stores are looking, hey, what's the latest and newest uh, flavor out there? And one of our newest one is one you just mentioned was the strawberry cheese. And uh, uh, we only, we had a customer from New Orleans ask us about if we could make a strawberry cheese uh, for their strawberry season down there in like February and March and April. And so uh, they gave us a challenge. And initially when I thought of strawberry and cheese, I was like, this just doesn't sound right. But by the time we were done, it turned out really good. And uh, it's fun where we were, um, we're, we're promoting it to wineries and things like, you know, especially if they're doing any kind of cheese and wine pairings. Uh, that strawberry cheese is a great cheese to pair with wines. 
And then we get, you know, then we get into a lot of different flavors, different peppers, uh, different combinations of, uh, of flavors. And yeah, so we have some of these, like, like uh, our dragon's breath, which is just, you know, a habanero cheese. Uh, we were even doing some like scorpion, uh, Trinidad scorpion, but we have discontinued a couple of the really super hot ones just because of employee safety issues. Uh, uh, you, you, you splash a little bit of the way in your eye or so you get it on your skin and it burns really bad. And so we just felt for employee safety, we, we went away from the super hot peppers and habaneros is about as hot as we get, but even those are really hot. Uh, we use a, you know, not just always a brine habanero, but we also use uh, a, a dried habanero flake, which is very hot on its own when you mix it with the cheese. Yeah, we're fortunate we get to try mango fire today. I'm looking forward to that. So that'll be interesting. That has been one of our uh, one of our most popular cheeses flavors that we make between that one and our hatch uh, pepper cheese. Um, we, we're not featuring hatch here and maybe a lot of us in the Eastern United States don't know much about hatch. Uh, it's it's more popular in the west part of the country, but it's um, there's a you know we're learning fast about it. So we use a mild hatch uh, that's been roasted, and it just has a nice sweet flavor, and um, and, and so that's been a really fun cheese uh, to make. But uh, like I said, our mango fire is probably right behind hatch in, in popularity. So here we've got the mango flavor with the heat of habaneros uh, as you swallow it. So it's kind of a, uh, what I really enjoy this cheese when you first eat it, you got the sweetness of the mango. Then you, as, as, as it moves you know, around your mouth, you pick up those cheddar notes. And then as you swallow it, uh, you have the habanero peppers that give you that, that little bite on the back end of your throat.